Over the years, Outdoor Idaho has tried to bring you interesting people, beautiful places, and we've tried to keep you up to date on the latest research projects of the Idaho Department of Fish and Game. Since its inception 50 years ago, the department has become much more scientific. And as you're about to see, some of those early research methods were, well, rather primitive. But then, so was television. Here is the airplane, and here is the salt. The job is to take the salt and put it where it is supposed to go. Because of the snow in the mountains, it's a job for an airplane. It's a job that has to be done well, and it's a job that has to be done at low cost. Each block weighs 50 pounds. In the trimotor plane, they carry 70 blocks to a load. Sometimes it takes two hours of flying to drop a load of salt. It takes a slow and powerful plane for this type of flying. It takes a plane which can carry a load. The airplanes which work in the mountains are mighty sensible planes. It's mountain flying and it's low flying. It's all in the day's work for the men who do it. Late 40s and early 50s, the department uh, firmly felt that the use of salt was to the, to the advantage of moving the animals off of uh, depleted winter ranges and hasten their departure to the spring ranges. In other words, it drew them off like a, like a kid to an ice cream parlor. They also felt that the uh, salt was, a, was essential to the nutritional welfare of the animals. But it was a massive undertaking. They did it with, uh, with ground transportation, even to the point of having a, uh, a uh, pack string that was hired to pack it into the remote areas of the uh, Selway Bitterit Wilderness. And then they transitioned to aircraft and dropped it out of the aircraft with the idea of uh, creating these, uh, as I say, quote unquote, uh, natural salt lakes. They stopped doing it in the, uh, in the, uh, the very late 50s and early 60s when, as I say, the Cooperative Research Unit at the University of Idaho proved that uh, basically that it just wasn't doing the job. They also found that that didn't, that didn't really change the normal routine of the animals in, the, in their departure from uh, winter range to spring and summer range. In the uh, early on activities of this department, a lot of it was predicated on, uh, it was predicated on uh, best judgment and not on, not on scientific investigative work. There just weren't, there weren't that many biologists in the department. The, bio the biology movement in the field of wildlife management was, was just an infant. And they just hadn't got that deeply started into a biological investigative work. And they simply did not have the answer that they have today. In 1938, the Department of Fish and Game was established by the legislature as a result of a petition by the Sportsmen of Idaho. A five-man commission was appointed by the governor and 73 employees were hired. Now, Marty Marash wasn't one of those original employees. He came on as a conservation officer in 1956. But a strong sense of history and tradition has made Marty somewhat of an expert on fish and game's past 50 years. This was 30 years ago in the, uh, the late 50s. This is the, uh, the operation of trapping and tagging antelope. That's me, yes. It used to be a very sophisticated operation, really, uh, where you would... Uh, and put a radio controlled vehicle out in the valley floor then you would put spotters up on the high points around and they would spot the antelope uh, does as they were nursing their fawns and once they, they uh, would uh, leave the fawns and go out to, uh, to uh, graze then the spotter would walk the radio controlled vehicle in close to the uh, where the fawns were put down by the, uh, the uh, doe. And the two men from the wing would come in with the, uh, with the dip nets and dip the, uh, the antelope. If you don't get them within a week of the, uh, of the time that they're born, then a human being cannot outrun them. And the radio, of course, was a breakthrough, too, in enhancing uh, communications between the uh, spotters and the trappers. Another breakthrough was the modern-day snow machine. The tucker? Well, the Tucker, uh, I would say, probably was in the, uh, the uh, mid-40s. They were fun, but you always took the chance of having to walk out. I spent all of one night walking out from Anderson Ranch Reservoir to Hill City. It was so cold that we couldn't stop to rest. It sounds like Marty and the other fish and game biologists did a lot of walking in those earlier days of wildlife management. 
I can remember participating in a lot of ground counts where they'd take you up to the top of the drainage and give your sack lunch and say, okay, we'll pick you up down at the, at the Barber Trailer, the old Barber Trailer Park. We'd stop on, start on top of Lucky Peak Mountain and we'd walk off all day long, come down, and we'd count the deer that we saw. Now that was that was a rough uh, management tool at best, but still it was at that time it was the best thing that they had going. Over the years, fish and game has moved populations of animals such as mountain goats and moose into historic habitat that they had abandoned or new habitat areas. The department reintroduced the California bighorn to southern Idaho and brought in some exotic species such as ring-necked pheasant, three subspecies of wild turkey, and the chucker partridge. One of the most uh, successful exotic plants have been the chucker partridge. Late 40s and particularly the early 50s and into the mid 50s, they really started to plant the birds as many as 5,000 a year. And those birds really took off about 1955, 56, when they had their first, I remember when they had their first seasons around 55 or 56. Hunting chucker partridge didn't require a controlled hunt permit. But if you were waiting for a chance at a particular elk hunt, this is how your permit was drawn. Today's computers have made the tumbler drawing obsolete. In, in looking at the 50-year review of the department progress, it's been astounding in how to, they've hung on to the wildlife resources of this state in spite of a lot of intense competition for the, uh, the habitat that supports the wildlife. But that's only a part of the story of the past 50 years. Land management, non-game, enforcement, engineering, all these were important elements that developed as the department grew. But probably one of the earliest things we associate with fish and game is, of course, the hatchery system. Information and Education Chief Bill Goodnight came on with the department as a fishery biologist in 1968. So they started initially raising fish for stocking areas that were devoid of fish or had been depleted with the thought of um, restoring natural reproduction and natural production. But very soon it became apparent that to provide good fishing, fish had to be raised to catchable size and released. Raising these fish in one primary location in the state provides a problem of distributing them all over the state. There's a problem in transporting them great distances because trout require um, a high, highly oxygenated water and cold water in order to survive these trips. Uh, the ice was originally placed in there, of course, to keep the water temperature down and also to keep oxygen content up. Water holds more oxygen the colder that it is. So uh, ice was used in the early days, and there were ice up stations along the routes from Hagerman to North Idaho. They'd stop in McCall and ice up again. Uh, of course, now all of the trucks are refrigerated. Fifty years has, has seen a lot of changes in fisheries in Idaho, and I think one of the landmarks over the last 30 years in fisheries management has been wild fish management, which has provided the opportunity for anglers to catch wild fish and the change of philosophy that's occurred among anglers, which uh, permits these fish to be released, caught again, and grow to large size, has helped us manage wild fish. It's been the cooperation of Idaho's anglers, hunters, and the folks interested in wildlife that has helped the department develop its management policies over the last 50 years. This teamwork approach resulted in Idaho's first Wildlife Congress in November 1988. Over a thousand delegates gathered in Boise to kick off the next 50 years of managing Idaho's wildlife resources. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. Uh, the first thing I want to do this morning is to extend my congratulations to each and every one of you who uh, took the time and the effort and the expense to travel to Boise for this Congress. Uh, I think it's a unique gathering. Uh, never before in the history of our state have we had uh, this number of people turn out uh, to, to get together with one interest in mind, and that is to, to maintain the natural resources uh, that make us such an outstanding state. The issues of concern were chosen by the delegates. A working lunch was provided, 
and the sportsmen divided into discussion groups and got down to work. Um, my job in this is, is going to be to just to keep the conversation moving and also to be a recorder. I'm going to be recording your ideas as they come up. You know, when, when we did uh, divide into our special groups today, it, it really was interesting how those different groups would listen to the opinions of a group that they weren't really familiar with. Well, I like to see it go from here, you know, is to get a Congress set up and have our regions and give the ideas and have them go to the legislators and say, hey, we do have a voice in Idaho. From the discussion groups, the delegates came up with a 37-point list of key recommendations. Individuals then marked the 10 issues that they felt were most critical. The top three included improved management of riparian habitats, equal status of fish and wildlife with other resources on public lands, and minimizing grazing impacts, especially to riparian zones. The final achievement of the Wildlife Congress was the election of representatives from each region. They will form an umbrella organization to continue to voice interests of the sportsmen and conservationists of Idaho. Well, I hope that, uh, that the follow-up will be real good. Uh, we're planning on putting out a newsletter in 60 days to everybody that attended. Uh, the council's being formed in 30 days. My, my perception is that we started the engine, and uh, I, I expect it to go on and become a major factor in the state. There are a lot of people that need to have credit for the work they did. But the bottom line is, if the, if the sportsmen of the state hadn't shown up, then uh, the whole thing's for nil. So the thing I'd like to thank people for is, is, is showing up and showing their interest. We've known it's always been there. And actually uh, uh, do something meaningful for wildlife. And I think that's the bottom line that, uh, that we were looking for, and we're really glad it worked out that way. Rocky.